Palm Olive Soap, Colgate Dental Cream, and Palm Olive Shave Cream bring you our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks and Stripes. Ever since Our Miss Brooks became an English teacher at Madison High, her motto has been life, liberty, and the pursuit of Mr. Boynton. But the shy biologist happens to be one of Cupid's coolest customers. And it's not easy to warm him up. So far, the best remedy I found is a hot water bottle. <laughs> My frustration reached a new high when, for some mysterious reason, Mr. Boynton coldly and deliberately avoided me last Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday. <laughs> Those were three days of no dates, no nothing. And by Thursday morning, his brush-off treatment had rendered me unbewitched, but definitely bothered and bewildered. Since I considered the matter highly personal, I decided not to discuss it with my landlady, Mrs. Davis, when I joined her at breakfast. Good morning, Connie. Would you like some oatmeal? I'm glad you brought it up. I haven't seen him in three days. <laughs> what? I haven't the slightest idea who you're talking about, dear. Good. You say you haven't even seen Mr. Boynton in the past three days. I simply can't understand his behavior. I can. Mr. Boynton has a guilty conscience, Connie. I feel it's my duty to spill what I know. Spill what you know? Exactly. Connie, would it surprise you to learn that Mr. Boynton is a two-timer? Yes, it would. With me, he's never even been a one-timer. <laughs> It grieves me to tell you this, dear, but last Monday, I saw him gallivanting around town with another woman. Another woman? So that's it. This woman, Mrs. Davis, is she attractive? Beautiful, I thought. Oh. And about how old is she? I think she's about 65. <laughs> 65? That's my competition? When he gets here, I'd like to be alone with him, if you don't mind. I understand. I've got to get dressed and run over to the conference anyway. They scheduled a family reunion party for tomorrow night, and Mrs. Conklin asked me to help with the preparations. They haven't had a family reunion in so long that she doesn't... Just a minute. That's probably Mrs. Mm Boynton. -hmm. I'll leave you two alone then, so you can pump him about that old lady he's going with. <laughs> There'll be no pumping, Mrs. Davis. I have no desire to delve into his personal affairs. Well, do as you wish. I'll see you later, dear. Come in. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Please sit down. Thanks. I'll pour some coffee and we'll have a nice little chat. Anything in particular you'd like to talk about? Well, no, nothing in particular, Miss Brooks. You pick the topic. Oh, no, you're my guest. You pick the topic. All right. Let's just talk about the weather. Fine. I'd like to know whether you plan to keep going with that old lady. <laughs> old lady? What old lady? She's a kid, about 65. <laughs> oh, that old lady. That's the one. <laughs> Get it. What's a 65-year-old woman got that I won't have? No. <laughs> now, just a minute. You see, I bought new furniture for my apartment last month, and since then I've been terribly in debt. For weeks, in fact, my landlady has been hounding me for the rent. So? And so I simply couldn't figure out how I could pay off my obligations until I saw this ad in the paper. Here, read it. Let's see. Wanted companion. Evening, 7 to 11. Salary, $35 per week. Send photograph and information to Joe Martell, Carlton Hotel. Well, I sent a note along with my photo, and the very next day the party sent me one month's salary in advance. In advance? $140. Now, until I actually reported for work, I had no idea that Joe Martell was a woman. An old maid in her 60s, in fact. The Joe is short for Josephine, you see. <laughs> well, naturally, I, I wanted to quit right off the bat. Why didn't you? Well, I couldn't, Miss Brooks. I'd already spent the $140. <laughs> oh, great. 
Philip Boynton, the lady's home companion. <laughs> the only way I could get out of the job would be to return Miss Martell's money. Now, in view of my desperate predicament, I was wondering if you might let me borrow enough. To, well, that is... Uh, well, could you give me a check for $140? Certainly. Then we could take turns bouncing it to the bank. <laughs> You are, Mr. Boynton. Then I'm stuck. Now, please understand, my relationship with Miss Martell is purely a business one. My principal duty being to escort her to fashionable places for dinner. Of course, she pays the check. Nah. Same type deal we have. <laughs> we always go Dutch, and you know it. I apologize. What are some of your other duties? Well, she happens to have very poor eyesight. So after dinner, I have to read to her. Then, when the reading is over, she pats me on the head as if I were a little boy and sends me home. Good night, son, she says. Son. She calls me son. It tears my heart out. Now don't cry in the coffee. It's weak enough. <laughs> Although it's perfectly innocent, I'm afraid that your whisking an elderly woman about town may cause tongues to wag. Yes, I'm well aware of that. I dread to think of the consequences if Mr. Conklin should get wind of it. In fact, I want you to favor me with the same promise I exacted from Miss Martell. If I should be asked the identity of my companion, she said, I promise that I'll never mention your name, son. I promise, too. Now pick up your beanie, son, and I'll race you to school. <laughs> Good morning, Harriet. Oh, hi, Miss Brooks. I was just going over to your classroom to look for you. Daddy said you had a march right to his office on the double. All right, Harriet. I hope my barracks bag is on straight. Right now. Good morning, Mr. Conklin. Miss Brooks, English teacher first class reporting, sir. Eddie. <laughs> yes, sit down, Miss Brooks. No, thank you. I'll stand, sir. And then I'll get right to the point. The members of my wife's family and of mine have come to town for a little family reunion. Oh, yes. Mrs. Davis mentioned that to me this morning. Yes, well, most of them are splendid people, good stock, but one or two are, uh, well, rather eccentric. Particularly my sister Hilda. Frankly, I'm worried about her, Miss Brooks. About Hilda? Yes, but I shouldn't really call her Hilda. She still uses her stage name, Joe Martell. What? <laughs> uh, the Joe is short for Josephine, you see. What did you say, Miss Brooks? I just said whoop. <laughs> That's short for I think I'll sit down after all. <laughs> Not for the fact that I need your help, Miss Brooks, I would not dare utter the horribly embarrassing impression that you are about to hear. Miss Brooks? Yes, sir? My sister is paying $35 a week to a gigolo. <laughs> I inquired as to the cad's identity, but Josephine softly refused to divulge his name. However, in an unguarded moment, Josephine let it slip that the water is a member of Madison's faculty. How do you like them apples? Not very tasty, sir. Why are you telling me all this? Because I want you to help me unmask that ear. Well... Then it's settled. <laughs> Bear in mind, we're looking for the slicker type, Miss Brooks, and if you should need someone to assist you, say maybe Mr. Poynton could help you find the wolf I want. I don't doubt that at all. But when Mr. Boynton drove me to school this morning, I noticed she was very tired, sir. Dead tired, really. So rather than burden him with... Oh, come in, Boynton. Come in. Thank you, sir. Uh, Harriet told me I'd find you here, Miss Brooks. Here's your purse. You left it in my car. Oh, thanks, Mr. Boynton. Mr. Conklin was just telling me about his sister. She came to town for a little family reunion. Your sister, Mr. Conklin? How nice. Her name is Joe Martell. Sir, he fell right on your floor. During the 
morning, Mr. Conklin made frequent visits to my classroom, and on each of those occasions, he expressed keen disappointment over my not having picked up any information which might lead to the horsewhipping of Josephine Gigolo. <laughs> As I entered the school cafeteria at noon, I was met by Harriet Conklin, who lost no time in giving me a flash. Miss Brooks, I know the man who's going with Daddy's sister. You do? Yes, ma'am. I wouldn't dare tell Daddy, though. It's Mr. Boynton. You're kidding. <laughs> no, I saw him escorting her into her hotel last night. And to think that woman's in her 60s. She was the first born in Daddy's family, Miss Brooks. Daddy was the last. That figures. <laughs> Harriet, I hope you haven't let anyone else in on that little bulletin about Mr. Boynton. Oh, no, Miss Brooks. I didn't tell a soul. Except Walter Danton. Oh, that's like giving it to Luella. <laughs> He's lunching at the corner table, I see. Oh, I'm sure Walter won't go blabbing it around. I told him it's a secret. Good. Excuse me, Harriet. Hello, Walter. Hi, Miss Brooks. Mr. Boynton's been running around with Mr. Conklin's sister. <laughs> Congratulations, your Secret Service badge is in the mail. <laughs> you shouldn't spread gossip like that, Walter. It could lead to Mr. Boynton's having his license revoked by the Gigolos Union. <laughs> or even being dismissed from our faculty. Oh, gosh, I wouldn't want that to happen. Actually, it's just a job, Walter. Miss Martell hired him to read books to her during the evening. Well, how do you like that? For five years, he goes more or less steady with you, only to wind up spending his evenings reading books to an old lady. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Must seem pretty plain to him after all those years of whisking me to the zoo. <laughs> but Mr. Boynton didn't really know what he was letting himself in for, Walter. Now he's got to figure a way out before Mr. Conklin can trap him. Well, maybe my agile brain can figure something out, Mr. Brooks. Yeah, I'll get the old bean working, and before you know it, I might dream up something. May I speak with you privately, Miss Brooks? There's no need for secrecy, Mr. Boynton. Walter's head to the entire situation. Yeah, I think it's real nervous. Of course, uh, we're rather young, Mr. Boynton, but won't you join us anyway? Thanks. I just talked with Miss Martell on the phone. I have to call her at noon every day to report to see, and she said tonight we'll meet at 6.30, son. Son? <laughs> she calls him son. Normally, I don't meet her until 7, but in spite of my discontent, she insisted that we meet a half hour earlier. Well, at her age, every half hour counts, I guess. <laughs> Where's the rendezvous to take place, Mr. Boynton? Well, now that the heat is on, I didn't care to risk meeting her at her hotel, and certainly not at my apartment, so... Well, this is an emergency, Miss Brooks, so I took the liberty of giving her your address. You're meeting her at my house? We'll be safe there. Be free yourself. He's going to hire a private detective the first thing in the morning. A private detective? With instructions to trail Miss Martell day and night and to surreptitiously photograph anyone with whom she's seen. Holy cow, the gig's up. Oh, you'll just have to quit, Mr. Boynton. Uh, tonight. I received $140 in advance, Walter, and I've already spent it. If I should tender my resignation, I'm afraid Miss Martell would demand the return of her money. Could you demand her loot back if she were to fire you? Well, No. According to our agreement, the money's mine, provided that I merely make myself available to her at the prescribed time. Of course, Miss Martell wouldn't dream of discharging me. She's too fond of me. She boasted, in fact, that in me she had found the direct antithesis of her former companion. Her former companion? Oh, well, yes. She fired him upon discovering that he was possessed of a dangerous split personality, Miss Brooks. While he was at all times the quintessence of propriety in her presence, she learned that he had another side. He was in the habit of consorting with unsavory characters, crooked gamblers, and gangsters. Gangsters? But wait a minute. The old bean's working. But, Mr. Boynton, you have just stumbled upon the means to get yourself back. What are you talking about, Walter? Well, a disillusion, the old girl. If you'll assume those same unsavory characteristics when you meet her tonight, Mr. Boynton, she'll probably give you the bounce just like she gave it to the other guy. You're being absurd, Walter. Why, in her own words, she once said to me, one look at you, and I was convinced that you were a wholesome, homespun, clean-cut American boy. She calls him son. Mr. <laughs> Boynton, if you take my advice... Oh, I'll accept I... your advice any time, Miss Brooks. 
What is it? Now, look, I'll admit my idea is real crazy, but it can do the trick. You've got to act tonight, Mr. Boynton. By tomorrow, the sands of time will have run out on you. It'll be Mr. Conklin who will fire you. Miss Brooks, would you want to see Mr. Boynton leave dear old Madison, maybe never to see him again? Oh, no. Don't listen to him, Miss Brooks. What's your advice? You've got to listen to me. Yes, give her the old split personality bit. Up to now, she's only... Or I can your hide. <laughs> I've been visiting with my sister Josephine Harriet. I happened upon a startling revelation, child. A what? Thanks to a note I discovered as I was leaving Josephine's apartment, a note which she had carelessly left near her telephone, I learned the identity of the scoundrel to whom she's paying $35 a week. It's none other than Mr. Boynton. Boynton! A gigolo! I thought he was Miss Brooks' property. <laughs> Why did the note say, Daddy? It said, meet Mr. Boynton, 630 at 209 Carroll Avenue. 209 Carroll Avenue? Somehow that address strikes a familiar chord. Seems to me I wrote a Christmas card to that address on... Yes! <laughs> That's Miss Brooks' house! I'm getting, Daddy. How do you like that? She's renting him out! <laughs> You don't mind having dinner in the kitchen, Mr. Boynton? Not at all, Miss Brooks. Hey, I like this corned beef hash you cook. It's different. It must be. It's supposed to be a veal cutlet. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Martell ought to be here in a few minutes. You'd better study your part. Honey. We're in the kitchen, Mrs. Davis. There's no need to let Mrs. Davis in on our scheme, Mr. Boynton. By the time she gets back from the movies, it'll all be over. Well, I wish it were over now. I'm getting awfully nervous. Oh, excuse me, folks. I'm afraid I'll be at the movies for quite a spell, Connie. I'm going to see Frankie Sinatra and from here to eternity. Fine. I won't have to wait for the Mickey Mouse short subject, though. I read the book. <laughs> Don't forget to fill the gold piece bowl for me, Mr. Boynton. I won't. Good night, Mrs. Davis. Good night, Connie. Good evening, Margaret. Oh, of good conscience. Oh, you startle me. Hello, Harriet. Oh, hi, Mrs. Davis. Were you leaving? Yes, for the movies. But it's so sweet of you to drop over. Why not visit with Miss Brooks and Mr. Boynton? They're out in the kitchen. Good idea. Splendid. We'll catch up with you later, Margaret. Good night. Good night. Come on, Daddy. She said they're in the kitchen. That's precisely why we're not going to the kitchen. Having Mrs. Davis let us in without announcing our presence is a stroke of luck. Now we can duck behind these hall curtains and eavesdrop. Daddy, isn't that an awfully sneaky trick? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, better wait in the living room. Sit down. Uh, where? That sofa near the hall curtain, right under the statue of the gargoyle, the one that always reminds me of Mr. Conklin. <laughs> now wipe that pleasant expression off your face and try to look sinister, Mr. Boynton. Remember, you're playing an underworld part. I'll do my best, but I'm not sure I can go through with it. Oh, that must be Miss Martell. I'll wait in the kitchen for my cue. Good luck. Thanks. Uh, come in. Good evening, Mr. Boynton. How are you? I said, how are you, Mr. Boynton? Something wrong, Mr. Boynton? Sit down, babe. <laughs> babe, it's me, Mr. Boynton, Miss Martell. So it's what? What? Now, let's get down to business, doll. Doll? I thought we ought to fast the breeze a little tonight about my salary. I need more loot. Loot? Oh, what's come over you? What happened to the sweet, clean-cut boy you used to be, son? Now, look, sister. I don't have to go into that namby-pamby act till 7 o'clock. 
which is when I go on duty for you according to our deal. So you got me a half hour early. So my agent insists I get a raise. And we ain't standing for no stolen from no dame, no how. Your language, Mr. Boynton. There must be some kind of a joke. You told me you're a teacher. That's right. I teach kids to pick pockets. <laughs> I'll make something out of it. Oh, good heavens, you've gone mad. I wish you two wouldn't talk so loud. You're disturbing the dice game in the back room. <laughs> He's my agent. Now, you better cough up that raise, Chubby. We wouldn't put on to put the screws on you, would we, Philip? <laughs> That's right. I never put the screws on no dame since I left Shy. Shy? That's underworld talk. Oh, my buddy. I think I'm going to see. Not here. We'll charge you extra. <laughs> Now, let's get with it, Martell. You either cough up more moolah, or I'll put the clamps on him reading Shakespeare to you. How dare you? Just who do you think you are to address me in that manner? She's my wife, that's who. Wife? His frown. The little woman. The old ball and chain. A better half. The old battle axe. The mother of my child. He calls me Mom. <laughs> Come in. Well, well, if it isn't our son, Walter. Only 16, but big as a horse. How are you, son? <laughs> he dropped in on his head when he was a colt. Miss Martell. Oh, uh, Martell. Oh, gee, you must be the chief all day to pay my day at 20, 35 fish a week. <laughs> what? Got bad news, son. She don't seem to want to give the raise. Oh, fiddle dee <laughs> Well, oh, where am I going to get the moon? I to buy a new crooked room wheel for school. <laughs> Good night, Mr. Boynton. As of this moment, consider yourself discovered. Well, that does it, Mr. Boynton. Uh, just about. Of course, as soon as I can dig up the amount she paid, I'll send it back to her. Every penny of it. Gosh, when she hired me just to escort her to dinner and read books to her, perfectly harmless things, the poor woman had such faith in me. And now this had to happen. Oh, come on. Cheer up, Mr. Boynton. I thought everything worked out swell. So did I, Mr. Boynton. Me too, son. <laughs> Mr. Conklin. Excuse me, I gotta be blowing back to shy. Oh, no, you don't. Sit down, babe. <laughs> Mrs. Davis had Harriet and me in as she was leaving for the movies, Miss Brooks. From behind that curtain, we heard every word of your dead end bit. I, uh, I better wait for you out in the car, Dad. Bye, folks. <laughs> well, now that our little group is down to a fortune, is Brig getting worse? <laughs> Brig? Get me a tall one I can leap off. Silence. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, from what I overheard, it's clear to me now that your association with my sister Josephine was of a perfectly harmless nature. So well, why didn't you come to me and explain that fact? Oh, well, sir, I was afraid that if you... Darling! Uh... <laughs> it's also clear to me that your little gangster scene was perpetrated to goad her into firing you before I could find out you were in her employ. Well, now that it's all over, all I can say to the lot of you is... Bless you. <laughs> huh? Bless us. Bless you. Who sneezed? I have tried vainly to dissuade Josephine from hiring male companions because those she has had in the past proved to be a mercenary lot of lame-brained loafers. In view of her violent reaction to your performance, I doubt that she'll ever hire another. I feel that I owe you a debt of gratitude. You really mean that, sir? From the bottom of my heart. I must be going now. Thank you, one and all, and good night. Wait, I think I'll go to the movies with Harriet, sir. It's all right, Mr. Boynton. Good night, Miss Brooks. Good night. Say, that gangster scheme did serve a pretty good purpose after all, Miss Brooks. 
Worked out fine. Uh, you know, even though it was Walter Denton's brainchild, you're the one who convinced me that I should go through with it. Uh, I, I don't know how to thank you, Miss Brooks. You don't? Think a little. I wish I could think of something, but I just can't. What can I do, Miss Brooks, to show my appreciation? Sit down, babe. <laughs> 